The tentative operating budget is $83,491,758, which is about $4.56 million greater or 6% greater than FY19. <coughs> the operating budget at this time does not contemplate any sales tax revenue, so our increase in the budget this year is primarily a function of our ad valorem <coughs> revenues. The tentative capital budget is $37,961,026, which is $5.3 million, or 16% greater than FY19. Unlike the operating budgets, capital budgets um, can roll from year to year depending upon the completion of projects. So while this budget is increasing, some of the projects and revenues that I'll demonstrate later on will be carried over from FY19. Uh, the new projects, though, represent about 30% or $11 million of the budget. They include things like state of good repair and safety initiatives. The total tentative operating and capital budgets combined is $121,452,784, and it's approximately $10 million or 9% greater than FY19. So this is a pictorial of the total operating and capital revenues and the percent that they represent within the total budget. Ad valorem and fares represent about half of our combined budgets. You'll see later that those two funding sources represent about three quarters of our total operating revenues. As far as federal grants, approximately a third of our federal funding supports our operating budget and two thirds support our capital budget. As far as state grants, 40% support operating, and the other 60% supports our capital. This is a chart that just depicts how the total operating capital budgets um, are divided uh, among our modes and projects. These percentages are relatively consistent year after year. So in terms of operating revenues for FY20 without the sales tax, we're only budgeting a 6% increase in our overall revenues, but we are planning to maintain our current levels of, of service. Uh, ridership is estimated to be relatively steady to FY19, and um, therefore our fares will also be flat to FY19. In July, uh, I brought to you the millage item. You adopted a half a mil as has been the, the case for probably the last uh, five to seven years. There was an approximate 9% increase in property values this year, which led to a $4 million increase in our Avalon tax revenue for FY20. We'll realize um, a, about a $3.3 .3 million decrease in state and local funding. This is primarily due to uh, several FDOT grants that were supporting the 275LX, which had been completely exhausted in FY19, and the local funding that we received in 18 and 19 for routes that were added back after Mission Max from the county. That, that uh, funding will not be renewed this year. Our mitigating strategy, however, um, is so as not to affect service, will be to defer our requisite uh, deposit into our fund balance. Um, until we really know the fate of the sales tax. <coughs> Essentially, we'll be borrowing from ourselves um, in order to maintain that level of service um, until we have a better idea of what we'll be able to do throughout the year to continue that service. Excuse me, is that reserved you're talking? About? Yes. yes. And just um, from my essay, what is our current reserves? Current balance today? Um, we have about four, about $4 million in the bank today. Um, we do expect at the end of this month to receive our injection of 5307, which will bring that reserve up to about $16 million. So these are our operating revenues broken down um, more granularly by the funding revenue sources. Um, the percentage um, are represented there, color-coded um, in the chart. Ad valorem is about 60% of our overall revenues, and it represents about 90% of the increase in revenues in FY20. Fairbox recovery continues to trend at about 15%, which is consistent with uh, the last few years. Um, and uh, again, we're not anticipating any additional increase over FY19. Part of the um, 
reason why our fare box recovery is slightly lower is because we did receive a grant from FDOT. This will be the second year in FY20, $890,000 so that we can offer free fares. Therefore, we're not recovering fares um, by providing that free service. Quick question. Mr. Chair. Okay. Is that uh, just for the streetcar or also free fares within the uh, our, our That's just for the streetcar. Just for the streetcar. Yes. So our federal funding is our third largest revenue source. The annual 5307 formula funding um, is about $13.5 million every year. In recent years, we've needed to use about 90% of that formula funding and operating to offset the cost of maintenance, um, as well as uh, to assist with paratransit services. In FY20, again, we'll be using um, actually about $12.5 million of that funding or 93% of our full allocation in our operating uh, budget. And finally, as I mentioned before, we're offsetting the loss of revenues from state and local contributions by not budgeting to contribute to our, um, to our reserves. Although we're not budgeting to the reserves, I, I guess I would say the good thing about that is we're also not taking from our reserves in order to balance the budget. So key operating expense drivers. Um, at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the month, I presented to the board uh, that we were had some overarching goals, including investing in our employees, investing in the core business, maintaining our financial stability, continuing to enhance uh, the customer experience and provide co uh, community value all of which require money to do that, um, but we are going to strive to meet all of those goals, even with our very limited and lean budget um, and an increase of only 6%. So the largest driver um, of our expenses is our staffing, as I, as I mentioned, at approximately 70% of the budget. Uh, it doesn't vary very much, doesn't vary from year to year very much. Um, we're service oriented, so 85% of our workforce are operators, mechanics, supervisors, customer service people that, that keep our buses on the road. Uh, so with the continued level of staffing, we'll have, or the continued level of service, we'll have the same continued level of staffing needs. So I mentioned overtime there. One of the things that we're looking to address is how we can drive down the overtime expenses. Um, we have a new HR director who's going to be looking at recruitment and retention efforts, uh, along with an internal workforce staff, uh, staffing um, task force that will help us with those initiatives as well. We'll be looking at potentially new hiring standards or potential applicant um, changes of qualifications so that we can increase our candidate pool, especially as we go into FY20 with the expectation of at some point being able to increase or enhance service. Cindy, do you know what our overtime expenses are right now? I do. <coughs> Great. Um, and and I, I will demonstrate to you that one of the areas that we are looking at is to positively affect that is, is overtime. Right now we're trending to spend $4.7 million. In the budget that I have presented today, That's we're attempting to reduce that by 30% to $3.3 million. So, um, Healthcare claims are projected to go up about 10%. Um, they have consistently been about 13% of our overall personnel costs. And again, we'll be looking at ways to drive that down through potential wellness efforts, uh, as well as looking at different insurance models or contribution uh, percentages that we can recover from employees. So I did mention two, a couple items here that actually we will look at, be looking to increase our investment in, which is technology, security, and bus parks. Um, specifically with respect to security, we are going to be increasing our budget by 50% for security. Uh, that is to offer level five security services with armed guards at our transit stations, as well as throughout our footprint. And of course, we all know we have an aging fleet with aging fleet come more repairs and subsequently more bus parts. Cindy, back to the healthcare um, yes. piece of it. What is our total healthcare expense this year? Uh, we will probably uh, finish the year with about $7.3 million in healthcare claims. So that's about 10% of our overall employee expense. 
it's it's actually about 13 percent. 13 total of the employee total. expense okay mm -hmm. All right. thank you excuse so, me can, yes. I, can I go back to overtime for a second? Yes. You said there's an HR initiative to, to help reduce that this year coming up. Uh, my calc is about 2.6 million in base salary. How, how many drivers does that take to eliminate a $4 million overtime? Well, er, it, overtime is, there is inherent overtime in the way in which mm -hmm. they, they schedule sure. operators' so. times. So, I would have to probably defer more to the operations <coughs> teams to tell you exactly how that breaks down. Um, but what I do know is they've budgeted to, or I would say inherently in the schedule, is about 80,000 hours of oper operator overtime, which is part of their regular pieces of work because work can't always be based on 40 hours a week. We're looking to probably, in, in FY19, it's almost double that. That kind of ask, answer your question. Could, could could you get back with me with a target of how many we're going to try and hire and how that how that'll work if you could? Just curious. And and I well I would only say one thing about in terms of vacancies. I do know that there's they're in a perpetual state of trying to hire drivers. Um, I believe right now there there is probably a 25, 30, 30 vacancies in, in mm. operators so at the moment. Tough to keep it full. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, keep in, and keep in mind, I mean, overtime is a, it's a function of the business anyway. There's, as you mentioned, there's going to be inherently overtime planned and scheduled and used. Um, I don't know if this year is just an anomaly year um, or if we've been riding high over that, you mentioned 80,000 hours, and, but it, it's a factor of the game, and I'll let this go. Sure. Um, this is a tremendous challenge that the industry is facing facing nationwide. There's really very few transit properties that are not seeing um, increased competition from the private sector for the same pool of operators, you know, those with the CDO, the Amazons and UPSs of the world, they pay very well. Uh, so what we need to do is focus on our salary structure, which we are as part of the ATU efforts, um, but also just being proactive with very aggressively recruiting new operators into our system, have larger classes when we do recruit those bus operators, and then also take measures to retain uh, bus operators into the future. I mean, we have a tremendous challenge in front of us because we are down, as Cindy mentioned, about 30 bus operators. But as we expand bus service, we're also going to have to significantly expand the number of operators on our roll. So uh, well aware of the challenges, but uh, looking forward to it. Good morning. Thanks. I'd like to ask also on the, uh, like the maintenance side, other than operation, the breakdown of the overtime, how do they play in it in other parts to make up the 100% overtime? Absolutely, and, and operators are not the only component of the overtime, so we, we can get a better breakdown for you, but um, I'd actually defer to Scott to, to, to say how many mechanics are, are we're down, but I'm, I think it's probably about 50, 50, okay, it's 12. So we're 12 mechanics down as well. So that, uh, again, accounts for some of the overtime when you have buses that have to get fixed and on the road and they pull out. Those mechanics are working overtime. Commissioner okay. Thank you. Um, uh, ben, I, I don't know when you mentioned it, I didn't catch, but I, I heard the private companies that are taking away with competitive stuff. Did, did you also say that, I know PSTA is uh, in Pinellas is paying like a dollar more an hour to uh, drivers, which has significantly hurt us. And I, I think it's just important to, to recognize that is a huge part of the market. Um, I just wondered, is it too, uh, I think it's really important with your budget document, and I don't know if this is possible or too complicated, but um, I think it's really important for people to understand how much of our operations is dedicated to paratransit which is a federally mandated, unfunded mandate, <laughs> by the way. And I think it's really it's, um, significant because the last time I kind of broke it out that I saw, 
it was like um, one six of the budget, and um, I, you know, I just wondered if because I it's integrated into all these categories, I assume. So is but is it is it done as a separate budget, and is it possible to kind of start to get a, a sense of that? Because I was very surprised when I recognized uh, that as a, a cost. Um, and Commissioner. Um, I presented this at the very beginning. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. And I can we can certainly break it down for you in a more granular way. But um, this year, paratransit will um, account for 6.7 percent of our total budget. Um, as far as our operating budget in and of itself, um, it represents a little bit higher because obviously that was a total budget. We can certainly do that. I will point out and and. Um, and you mentioned it being an unfunded mandate, although the FTA does allow us to use up to 20% of our federal formula funding um, for the um, complimentary ADA service, which we have typically done for the last three years. So we, we do channel about $2.5 million of our 5307 into our paratransit service. And it looks like just in, in terms of when I, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to say more about that? Um. Just a quick calculation of paratransit budget is about 8% of the operating budget, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. I just kind of think it's good for the public to understand and know that too. I think it's an important point, um, the kind of services we do. And it's some of the most, as we know, uh, expensive service we provide. Sometimes uh, um, I've heard upwards of 100 or $150 per trip um, of, of the cost. And it's important, important service. I'm not. But um, just, I, I think it's important that that be part of uh, what we talk about and recognize. Okay. Um, and just in terms of, uh, so it looks the, I know the question was asked about health care. And it looks like um, where, uh, I know when I, the first year I came on the board, it, that was caused a kind of crisis here mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the health care going from three to seven million dollars. <laughs> and it looks like we're just kind of, uh, settling in here, which I expected at the seven million dollar part. So that's a lot um, a greater percentage of uh, what we were uh, dedicating our budget to than than we have been historically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I was actually very pleased to see that also. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay, so getting back to the expense, expenses more uh, broken down. Um, again, knowing that we had to find savings throughout our budget in order to keep our current uh, service levels, um, staff really did an excellent job of reallocating your budgets and, and trying to find um, room in those budgets um, and getting down to what is really mission critical. Again, you can see the um, between the salaries, fringes, and health care at the top that they represent about 70% uh, of our budget. And again, I mentioned that within that salary category is overtime. $3.3 million is being budgeted for overtime, which will require a valiant effort um, within HR and operations in order to get the current trends um, a little more under control. Uh, when you look at the difference column there, um, you'll see that there are things in red. That's where we look for uh, those, those categories of savings. Um, I wanted just to point out that some of the larger categories, um, operational contracts, which I um, mentioned is one of those expense categories that will go up in FY20 include IT and security. Um, again, th those two items right there are about $3 million um, of that category. There's also the downtown or service that you approved at the beginning of this year uh, through March, uh, voice of the customer surveys, um, bus stop and facility maintenance. Um, and then the paratransit customer choice program, which we will continue into FY20. That program costs us about $1.4 million a year. The largest component of the other administrative, I always get the question, well, what's in that category? Um, that, that's where other, uh, most of our other administrative expenses go, but I wanted to point out that the tax collector um, and property appraiser fees that we have no choice in paying, that's about $1 million of that category, which is about 50%. So um, I just wanted to highlight a few of those. So this is quite a busy slide. Um, I could certainly break this, this out um, differently for you. 
um, if you want more information. Um, but I wanted to highlight some of the revenue sources and then I'll talk a little bit about the projects at the same time. So in our capital budget, we have a 5.3 million um, increase over FY19. The primary driver of that increase is um, FDOT funding for $6 million over FY20. Two projects that are being funded uh, with that funding, with that uh, funding is the HM building renovation, which FDOT has given us $3.5 million for in FY20, as well as the regional fare box collection, uh, otherwise known as Flamingo, which increased by $2.5 million in FY20 as well. The FTA formula funding is actually comprised of three different grants that we get every year. The 5307, which you all are very familiar with, I think, which I mentioned before, we allocate about 10% to our capital budget every year. It's about $1.3 million. The 5339, which is bus and bus facilities, which is about $1.7 million. And the 5337, which is a state of good repair, and that supports the streetcar, and that's about $700,000 a year. Um, so you can see that the funding there is an aggregate of what we expect to receive, not only in FY20, but any funding that has yet to be fully expensed and is just being rolled forward into FY20. The discretionary funding, for that's 15%, that's made up of three different awards that we're, um, one of which is being just rolled over um, from previous years. That's an earmark for the HM building. We have about $3.7 million left of that grant to spend down. We received $1 million from an emergency relief uh, resiliency grant for stormwater improvements this year. And the remaining $800,000 is for a TOD pilot grant, um, which you can see in the, the chart to the, the right is in the middle. It's, it's for a pilot study um, that we'll be undertaking in FY20. And then the last category there is the FHA transfer funding, which is known as the Surface Transportation Block Grant. Um, in FY17 and 18, we received a total of $14.5 million for bus replacements. Um, in 19, we receiving, we're receiving, or we received a little over $6 million for our CAD AVL ITS replacement, um, as well as some streetcar infrastructure improvements that are underway right now. And in FY20, we'll receive $4 million for paratransit uh, van replacements, as well as a new CNG compressor. Um, and those projects are listed uh, as well. And then just that little sliver, the local funding, I wanted to point out that that is for mobility fees that we collect from the county and the city. Um, those funds have to be used in certain zones. So what's budgeted every year is what's anticipated uh, to be able to be used in those specific zones. We actually do receive more funding than what's budgeted this year, but it depends on the project that we can actually implement in that in those zones. Um, but if you look at the bus stop and shelter program in the chart, mobility fees are about 60% of that total allocation. So the other projects that I wanted to highlight, and you're all very familiar with the bus driver safety shields, that will be completed in the first quarter of 20. That's why they're, even though they're underway now, they're being, they'll, they'll be included in our FY20 budget to be spent down. Um, we brought to you um, the state of good repair uh, back in October. We said we had a $43 million backlog. So with our limited funding, we're kind of chipping away at that as, as we can. Of um, most immediate need are 44 uh, paratransit vans that we'll be replacing. Um, as well as 16 support vehicles, and um, we're gonna overhaul four of our streetcars. And again, I mentioned the uh, barriers that we're doing for our safety initiatives. We'll also be continuing to, to install cameras on our vehicles as well as on our facilities. Okay, so with, um, with that, if the committee cho chooses to advance this to the board, we'll go to the two public hearings in September. We have the first public hearing on the 9th that will approve the tentative millage and budget, and then final adoption will be on the 23rd. Okay. Any questions? Commissioner Kent? Um, you mentioned mobility fees that come from the city and county. So they're not broken out here, but you said it's all put into <clears throat> bus stops and shelters? That's right. So is, is the total that's in bus shop, bus stops and shelters, the total of mobility fees that um, that heart gets? 
No, we have a, a, actually a much larger um, reserve right now that could be used in various stones should we have a project um, or projects that would allow us to spend those funds down. That 523 is just what we anticipate being able to do in those respective zones. And I'll, I'll find out later, but I'd kind of like to know what um, we are getting from the county and city specifically in mobility fees. I also think just in terms of the budget, and I'm, I'm fine, but I think it is valuable, and in, we've had it in past years, and I know this is this kind of presentation, but I think it's really valuable to see, and maybe it won't be so valuable in the future if we take a big jump up, but to, to see it over a decade, which is what we've seen, so that you can notice when uh, things cost change. Um, I have another question that goes back to the fuel cost, because what I understood is what um, hurt us uh, this year or caused a huge impact on the budget was unexpected rise in fuel costs. Um, and I just see it's um, here in FY20 for um, 4.6 million or FY19, and then it goes down to 4.2 million in 2020. And, and I don't have any of the past years to, to measure it against, but I don't, could, could you address that and why would you expect it to um, reduce and, and what kind of jump was it? Well, when we budgeted in FY19, we budgeted based on two, I believe it was almost 250 a gallon. Um, I would have to go back and verify um, to see what the, the last price we paid, but it was somewhere around $1.90, I believe. So actually, this is a decrease in our budget. It's also uh, consistent with the way in which we're trending this year with, with gas price, with diesel prices. And my other is with the capital projects, it's not a big capital expense in terms of how they go, but we do have a CNG duplex compressor in there. Yes. So um, um, what, is, what is that and how, why is it needed? And, uh, if you could just address that. Okay, I'm not sure, but I can maybe ask one of our maintenance um, <coughs> experts if they would mind explaining that. All right, Deputy Chief Maintenance Mr. Scott Train. But this, uh, this compressor is for, uh, it's needed for, to make the recovery time more efficient for our CNG fleet. We added 10 more. Uh, we're averaging about seven to 12 minutes recovery time. So this would be more efficient to make it a lot faster to get the bus the back right this way. So it is, something that is part of the CNG infrastructure that speeds up mm -hmm. the uh, gas going to the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and we have how many? We have 10 of them? No, no, we, we've got 10 new, we added 10 CNGs to the fleet. Is it something that's done per bus? Well, each, each vehicle, uh, fueling time is between seven and 12 minutes. We'd be able to make that more efficient and cut that time down uh, to speed up the Time. Okay, thank you. How many CNG buses are we running now? Uh, 77. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and Commissioner Kemp, I wanted to mention that um, every year we provide a report um, to the city and the county for our impact fees, and it does have the total collection as well as what we're anticipating to spend and on the projects. So I can provide you those two reports. Great, thank you. Any more questions? <coughs> and you, go ahead. Good morning, thank you for the overview. I missed part of it, but the question I have is centered around the actuals versus budget on each one of the slides. Uh, I see that it indicates FY 2019 budget, but where, is, where should I see the actuals? We haven't had the actuals posted yet. We'll know that um, we can give you a trend or an anticipated FY19 um, actuals, uh, but of course we haven't finished the year yet. Um, but what I will say is we do that trend in order to help prepare the FY20 budget. So these budget numbers are very much in line with what we anticipate uh, finishing the FY19 fiscal year. Right? An actual or a stretch? No, actuals. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I guess we have to approve this to move to the board. Um, so, um, motion? Motion to, per, to okay. uh, uh, proceed and, and bring the, the, the draft document to the board. 
Second. So we have a motion to move this to the full board, and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's approved. Thank you, Cindy. Great Thank briefing. You. Appreciate it. Our next presentation uh, will be the Independent Oversight Committee proposed service planning projects for 2020, and this is in regards to the referendum funding. Yeah, and if I please make a couple comments to introduce this topic. Um, as you all may recall, during our preliminary budget overview that we provided to this committee as well as the board in July, we had a very high level summary of what our program of projects was going to be for 2020 for submittal to the independent oversight committee. Uh, we then prepared a more detailed overview and presented it to the board in August. So this is our preliminary final draft. So it's really the third look-see at the program of projects that Hart intends on submitting to the independent oversight committee. The logistics and details about how we submit the list are still being, um, you know, there's lots of conversations about exactly how that's going to be done. The IOC's first meeting, I believe, is towards the end of this month. I forgot the exact date. Um, but they do anticipate meeting at least twice prior to September 30th when, when the um, program of projects are due from each of the uh, funding recipients. The last thing I would say is staff has been coordinating very closely with the city of Tampa staff as well as the county to make sure that we are preparing our program in concert with one another. So there's been tremendous coordination going on at the staff level. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back over to Chris Cochran. Yeah, and before, and Chris, before you speak, all I'd ask of the board, though, is is please take a hard look at this as Chris presents it. Um, what I would like to do is present something to the overall board that goes through rather quickly because I think we're on a fairly fast track here with our proposals. With that said, don't hold back. If there's things that need to be done in this briefing, let's, let's get it and get it right and then get it to the board. Mr. Chair, yes. just a, a yes, sir. great point. Um, is uh, just a quick clarification for staff. Are, or is action required today on this presentation? Um, action is required in the sense of advancing it to the board for consideration, so yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Um, thank you, committee. Chris Cochran, uh, Director of Service Development. Um, as uh, Mr. Limmer stated, this is uh, your third uh, uh, our, our opportunity to present to you the sort of the third version of our uh, program of projects that we are looking to bring forth to the Independent Oversight Committee by September 30th. Um, this is uh, is similar to what you saw at the board meeting uh, or earlier this month. However, we have uh, uh, greatly um, refined the numbers to give you a much better uh, detail of what we're looking at from a budget standpoint. Um, and um, some, some better details as, as to how we're looking to uh, implement it. So again, um, really giving you an, a broad overview of the program and project strategy here is really resetting this baseline that we have um, um, and um, establishing a vision and looking to achieve a vision um, for 30 years out and, and how we're going to be able to uh, spend this money um, and identify what the funding is and being able to put something on the street long term that the people are um, the people of Hillsborough County are, uh, are, are wishing to have. Um, the, the three primary um, elements of the of the 2020 um, vision here is is continually um, funding some of the, the partially funded services, including 275, 48, some of the county funded services, um, resetting that baseline, uh, which is really focused on delivering customers a high quality service, a reliable, uh, more expanded hours of service, reassessing our mission max routes that we can bring back for some of the customers um, that have really um, uh, been very vocal about what they would like to see come back and, and identifying what of those mission max routes we can we can bring back in a way that is uh, maybe even more efficient than they were before, um, and then there is a capital needs um, focus as well, and that includes 
um, various infrastructure, um, fleet, uh, uh, both fixed, rust, uh, fixed route buses and van fleets, uh, maintenance facility needs, and of course amenities for the customers in, in way of uh, better, better uh, shelters and, and bus stops to make uh, the experience better. Um, and then overall, establishing a vision and giving us the opportunity to create a project plan long term, as I said, in, in creating a long term vision. And this includes um, doing a major TDP and a 30 year vision plan, uh, which will be established early next year and us moving that forward. And that'll allow us to really identify from the baseline um, how we grow premium services um, in a uh, financially sustainable way. Um, as well as uh, identifying those fixed guideway projects that fit into the 35% um, bucket of funding. And again, um, as, as you all are well aware, we have our three buckets of funding uh, that are aimed at enhancing bus services, ex expanding our public transit options, 35% uh, really looking at uh, more or less uh, exclusive right-of-way uh, projects, and then we have sort of the flexible funding in the 20% there. <clears throat> Chris, before you move forward, yes, question sir. on the on the amounts you have here, forty five. Yes. Is this the notional amounts based on the dollar amount we would receive, or is this what we anticipate in our proposals of spending towards those avenues? This, this right now is, is the anticipated. And at the end, I will show you our um, our um, anticipated twenty nineteen and twenty twenty um, um, sales tax receipts okay. that, that we're anticipating to have. So we're, we're looking at, um, overall right now, we're looking at, at an estimated $125 million for 2019 coming in uh, for HART alone. Um, and that will be divided up 45%, 35%, and 20% as, as noted on uh, the slide here. Um, and again, the, the enhanced bus services really looking at fixed route services in neighborhoods, express routes, circulators, those types of services, really looking at expanding ridership um, and increasing uh, uh, better services. Um, the 35% again on, on right-of-way, uh, exclusive right-of-way projects, and the 20% is for, uh, really can be spent relatively, uh, uh, it's relatively flexible in how we can spend it as long as it is um, a, uh, a public transit project. So uh, diving a little deeper into exactly what the services are for each uh, bucket, if you will, the 45% of the enhanced bus services, we'll be looking at, at three primary elements here for fiscal year 2020. And number one, that's restoring services that were cut in 2018 as part of Mission Max. And some of the routes we're looking at right now are the Route 46, the 4, um, and the 41. There'll be a map on the next slide so you can see a little more detail. But we are looking at doing a, um, some community outreach to ensure that those are um, exactly the routes that need to be uh, put back. We, we know that there's um, a lot of need out there, um, and we want to ensure that what we're putting back is, is serving the people's needs. Um, the um, uh, improved frequency, uh, more weekend service, really bringing, um, aiming to bring a lot of that weekend free uh, service up to 20 minutes where possible. Um, and in increasing weekday frequency as well, and bringing a number of core routes up to 15 minute frequency and, and continuing to move towards that, um, that high frequency grid that we've been aiming for for a long time. Then there's a capital uh, allocation um, element here where we're really focused on the vehicle expansion component, uh, facilities improvements. We have some IT infrastructure needs um, as well as planning needs and continuing to look in, in how we um, expand the services. Mr. Chair, just a quick question. Thank you, Chris. Um, just a quick question about uh, frequency and, and uh, uh, reliability. The one bullet I don't see here is, uh, is also like time of day and late night. And I know it's been brought up before. How are we doing in that category? Is that is that kind of covered and we don't need to um, to, to look at that, you know, in this 45% or how, how are we doing in that? Um, absolutely. Expanding, uh, enhancing bus service will include, um, uh, thank you for pointing that out. We'll be sure to make sure we better notate that. Um, early, expansion of hours would absolutely early be late. Okay. something. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. We, we'll be sure to uh, um, add that in there for the board. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. So um, looking at the, the specific um, um, sort of give you an idea 
Uh, you've seen this at the board meeting as far as uh, looking at some of the restoration of services initially in 2020 that we can do within the the ability of our of our resources that we have for the amount of buses and full-time employees that we have in 2020 that will uh, continually be able to ramp up beyond 2020 but um, this, th these are the, uh, the the three routes that we're looking at um, right now uh, we are also considering some routes um, extending some routes further up north in the uh, north of Fletcher area uh, where we've, we've heard a lot of um, um, a lot of community feedback from people and for, for a while so we're 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 Figuring out that that 3.7 million would still may be maintained as as our goal, um, our goal budget, and we would be able to tweak what services we would uh, we would do for exactly what what project there. Improved uh, weekend frequency. Um, you see a good uh, a good focus on the core services, and definitely a big need on Route 31 and providing some expanded service to South County that we've been wanting to do for a long time, um, and being able to give some people connectivity from the uh, Amazon Center um, uh, all the way up to uh, the Brandon Mall area. And then uh, weekday services, again, this is uh, really looking to increase the frequencies, um, uh, kind of cut the frequencies in half, um, and this is really focused on on our uh, on our core areas as well. Um, um, those routes are, are really some of our um, uh, higher higher ridership routes that serve a lot of the uh, transit dependent uh, folks as well. That serve uh, a number of uh, job centers and uh, population centers as well. And I do want to point out the numbers that you see on here: the 3.7 million, the 1 million, and the 875. These are based on the the amount of money we would spend in 2020 in a phased approach, not the fully, not the full um, annual cost, and I'll explain a little more um, on a slide coming up here, so, and that'll make sense, um, a little more sense to you. Um, so this is really um, looking at the all of the enhanced um, bus services that we're looking at in 2020 in addressing. Um, you see, we have really good coverage across the county that we're looking to to be able to address some of their requirements down there. Are are being able to put the, the nearly 100,000 additional hours on the street, um, needing to, to uh, identify and, and fill uh, 56 additional full-time positions by, uh, by the summertime uh, uh, next, uh, next year, as well as uh, 16 buses. And uh, we are well on our way and being able to fulfill those needs. So here's the, um, uh, this is the, the, the budget overlook. On the graph on the right, um, if you look, this is where we get, we have the numbers from the restored service, the weekend improvements, and the weekday services. You see, we, we have our three we have our three markups every year: spring, summer, and fall markup. So we would phase in those services. Over one, um, we would do some of the restored services in the spring. The weekend improvements would launch in the fall, and then the weekday improvements in the uh, excuse me the weekend improvements in the summer and the weekday improvements in the fall. And then on the left there, those would be the ongoing annual costs. So next year, being able to phase in what we're proposing here would cost about five and a half million dollars. Beyond 2020, those same services would cost about ten and a half million dollars annually um, go, um, to continue those, those specific improvements. The capital allocations that we have in this particular bucket uh, it was about a hundred and little over 108 million dollars, and that um, really is um, primarily focused on vehicle replacements, um, facility improvements. We have some ITS needs and radio communications, fare box replacements. So there's a few really large um, projects um, in that capital allocation that will fit into that enhancing bus service bucket of funding. Moving on to the 35% um, expanding uh, uh, public transit options bucket here, we have a, um, our, our, our total allocation is, is about $88.5 million for this uh, specific bucket of funding. At this point in time, we don't have, uh, being very early in the process, obviously, we, we don't have any specific um, right-of-way projects that we would be investing heavily in, so there will be a significant amount of, of reserve, if you will, in this bucket, um, to the tune of uh, a little over $82 million that will be um, unspent in this bucket for the first year. 
Um, but we do have um, um, slated in there um, a shared project cost in the uh, Envision Tampa Streetcar project uh, to the tune of uh, $1.5 million um, ongoing in that, in that project. The, the Florida <coughs> Nebraska BRT study, um, we don't exactly know what that, uh, what that funding will be. That'll be something that comes out of the study, knowing uh, exactly what, those, uh, what the capital needs for that will be, and we'll have a better idea of that um, down the road. And then we, we have identified some additional planning needs, um, and that um, somewhere in the range of uh, you know 4.8 to, to five million dollars or so. Looking at corridor studies for CSX and um, maybe the streetcar beyond where it where it's, we're looking now. Where does the streetcar go beyond uh, the current project? And additional BRT corridors as well, um, or, or in, um, some kind of in, you know enhanced um, premium service corridors. And then we have our uh, third bucket, which um, uh, really kind of our flexible funding, if you will. Um, in this allocation, we, we have um, uh, $50, $50,600,000 allocated to this bucket. It, um, one portion of it, a um, little over $24 million, is really made up of a myriad of different projects from capital needs, administrative operations, uh, planning needs, um, IT infrastructure, um, we have some maintenance technology needs that will really help us improve the uh, efficiency in which um, we're able to, uh, to keep our buses on the road, um, and then uh, facility improvements as well. Uh, one note in here that's very important to address is um, we're looking at reallocating $20 million of existing services to the IOC funding. Um, so we would take um, $20 million that's currently funded from our ad valorem um, dollars and we would move that into this flexible funding. Um, and then that, that opens up $20 million of the ad valorem funding to be able to put towards our reserves. And that is a, um, so that is a, um, a, a plan that, that we're looking at addressing with some of these flexible fundings uh, here. Um, so, and then we sort of outline the, the funding of these existing services. Um, which includes that $20 million that I just spoke of, and that includes the county-funded services, uh, the 275 and the 48 as well. And we will identify exactly what, um, what services make up that $20 million. And again, that, that will be, uh, um, um, part of that will be coming from the community outreach that we do as well. So this is our proposed project list, um, kind of a rolled up version of it. Um, I believe we've handed out a, an expanded version of it that um, um, under each one of these categories is, is, a, um, uh, is an expanded version of, of what makes up each one of these uh, line items. And uh, if you have any questions about that, be happy to uh, address it the best I can. And Cindy's here as well. Um, but that really gives you um, those, those numbers up top and the very top line are where we got the numbers for each one of the buckets in the previous slides. So the total tax revenue estimates um, over the next two years, we're looking at a little over $250 million for, uh, excuse me, for 2019 and 2020. Um, and so 20, 2019, we're looking at about $124.2 million estimated, and uh, 2020, close to uh, $129 million, about a th little over 3.5% increase between the two years. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm looking at the type sheet now, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure how to read this. Uh, one of the line items is called quarter studies, and then in bold it says planning CSX evaluation. <clears throat> What's quarter studies are all studies in general, and CSX is only allocated 100,000? Is that what that's telling me? Or? Well, we, we, we've identified a specific, um, on September 9th, we'll have, uh, on our agenda, we'll have um, some uh, people coming to speak on the CSX uh, project for the future. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Charlie Banks, um, who's a um, um, really a, a well-respected and renowned um, uh, subject matter expert. Um, and, you know, our, our idea here is to have an initial evaluation. There is way more than we 
had initially anticipated involved in all of the different uh, intricacies of the, of the number of subdivisions in the area. Um, so before we, we, we need to identify exactly what we need for a corridor study. So you almost need a reevaluation, if you will, to uh, ensure that, that what we're moving forward with I mean, it's a, the CSX corridor study, um, when we get to that point, is going to be a, um, a, a big investment. And we want to ensure that we are moving in, in, in the most effective way um, in, in doing that study, if that makes yeah, sense. I, yeah. I, I think I understand that, which is sort of why I was wondering how this is phrased. Two million is for all corridor studies in general. And only 100,000 is allocated to CSX? Well, so for, 20, for 2020, now, so, so every year we will, um, it's, it's tough to put a number on it exactly at this point in time, because we don't, you know, we don't, we don't know 100% what a corridor study is going to cost. That is kind of based on um, our doing a little bit of research and seeing what you know what other course corridor studies are going on um, we felt it's a fair a fair number to put in there at this point in time and these numbers um, you know to these numbers um, we will be able to amend um, you know we, we don't want to do that go, go ahead yeah just a little point of clarification there's a lot of interest out there in doing more detailed corridor planning studies on a variety of routes. At CSX, I hear a lot about Cypress and bus rapid transit, and I've heard some other suggestions about the next phase of the Florida and Nebraska bus rapid transit, as well as some others. Um, we have not done robust community outreach around the specific bucket allocations. That's something that we plan on doing um, in the coming months once we um, figure out from our customers as well as the stakeholders throughout the communities we serve what their priorities are, then we will bring more definition to what specifically is part of that $2 million of corridor studies. So we thought it'd be best to be more general at this point with the CSX corridor, what we did is we pulled out a separate hundred thousand dollars to do because we know that we would like to have um, more of a path forward for the CSX. So we're still in a very simple um, um, evaluation of the CSX corridor starting next month. Well, I, I, let me just offer a couple of comments and ask a question. I mean. 100 doesn't seem like enough to deal with the complexity of the CSX issue. So that's just one thing to consider. But I guess I have a question. We have by four, September 30, we have to submit something to the IOC. Is it sufficient, and I'm really directing this to David Smith, is it sufficient for us to say to the IOC, we have Two million proposed in quarter studies, which is part of that fixed route bucket, the 35%. Is that sufficient to allow us to get an approval and then use that two million for any type of quarter study during the year? In part, to answer your question, the IOC, when it meets, is going to establish some ground rules and some bylaws. So the specificity that is necessary to answer your question doesn't currently exist. The Article 11, as it exists, and I'm not familiar with what changes, if any, Hillsborough County is proposing in the ordinance, simply provides a set of parameters that are pretty broad in scope. And it, there are some problems with the way those parameters read, even under the way the judge has altered it, uh, that we can talk about at some point if, if we need to do that, because I'm concerned that we make sure we get as much proposed in front of the IOC as we possibly can before September 30. And what I mean by that is what the judge has done is he's stricken the language that says approve, but it still retains the language that says the IOC must certify that it conforms to the requirements of Article 11. 
what difference there may be between approval and certification is something lawyers will spend a great deal of time on. But I'm recommending, and I've talked to the CEO about this, that we approach the IOC and recommend that they both certify compliance and that they approve the expenditures in the event that the appeal ends up going back to what the referendum language said, we will have an approval rather than simply certification. I would suggest that certification and approval are really the same thing and are really what was intended by the uh, Charter Amendment in the first place. The IOC's role is not to supplant the BOCC, as argued by our opponent. It was simply to ana analyze the data and provide a certification that would both be a conduit both ways to citizens. But anyway, back to your question, this, the detail needed is a real issue. And one of the things I'm hoping we're doing, I have a draft letter to Dr. Wong, when they have their meeting, is to provide us that specificity so that our submittal is as defensible as possible. I realize that's not a very precise answer to your question, but we just don't have that much precision well, I, yet. I would just certainly suggest that we attempt to keep it as general as possible because I recognize the chicken and egg problem right. that we have until you begin a study you don't necessarily know what the scope of that study is going to be and where that's going to lead you. So to the extent we can say $2 million for fixed guideway type projects would be great. That would give us the flexibility. To Agree. You don't need specificity that isn't there yet. Yeah. Yeah, so we will absolutely make it clear that those corridor studies are in the fixed guideway category and as such would meet all of the minimum operational requirements that were included in the um, in the sales tax program itself so yeah. okay. thank, thank you mr chairman um chris question couple questions uh, how much of this package is for the 21st street maintenance facility re overall because there's a subtotal anywhere. I know it seems to be broken down between a lot of different areas. Um, I believe the original requirement was what, 25 million to bring it up to speed? Is that, is that, is that a fair number? Um, within this particular list, there's $33 million that's allocated specifically for the uh, renovation of the building. There's also a stormwater component. Good. I believe it's $5 million within this budget. Um, we also then, as I just presented to you, have about eight and a half million dollars in our funded budget. So right now, um, you know, we're looking at probably about 45 million dollars that we could effectually fund should the sales tax um, be applied. At the, at the moment, we don't know exactly what the project's going to look like. It's kind of contingent on what our footprint needs to be based on the level of growth that will that we'll be experiencing over the next 10, 15, 30 years. Does this, how, how what, what percentage of, of uh, completion for the wish list that, that the, 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 the people in the, in the facility have? I mean, are we looking at a $60 million budget? Are we looking at, you know, proposal? Are we looking, does this cover it? Um, it this, what we have here in, in the funded budget may not cover it. It really does. I, uh, it's an evolving project, right, and we've understood. seen a couple different levels of, of completion um, or levels of um, project estimates. Well, we just Six, have to be careful with scope 60 creep million. It, it could be 70 million. Yeah. Um, it, at this point, we don't have an exact amount, um, but I will say that most likely what we have allocated here as well as in our funded budget, it probably will not be enough. Um, but we will then look to future years of sales tax in order to, to further supplement what you see in front of you today. Okay, just so we have, just, just so we prevent cre scope creep and the thing just keep, you know, mushrooming and mushrooming. My second question is, um, there's a line, on, a line item in here, um, evaluation of ferry services. Is this an addition in light of the county commission actions last week? Or? Yes, sir. Because this has, I don't think this has come before the board yet it has not. in any capacity. So I'm just you know, kind of new exact, at this. Yes, so I'm a this little, is an exact byproduct of that decision okay. at, the, at the board and of the county commission. And then last, the, the real estate component of $9 million, what, what, what is that? 
Specifically, that's a $5 million improvement to a piece of property that we just entered into a lease with FDOT for, which is on 50th Street. Um, that is going to be improved for um, primarily for infrastructure to accommodate electric buses, as well as overflow parking, and, and I think they'll do some staging there. I'm not exactly sure it, all of the, all of the um, uses of that, but it's primarily for electric bus infrastructure. What about the northwest part of the county? Was it was there any any uh, unless I unless I'm not seeing it? Was there any thought given to uh, securing property for that for the northwest quadrant? Um, yeah, I can certainly uh, clarify that as part of Chris's presentation. He outlined the need to do an updated bus plan as part of the COA. Um, a key component of the COA is going to be identifying where future bus services will travel throughout the county. Then to support that, there's going to be a variety of facilities. So a maintenance facility in some other location within the county as well as, you know, transit centers and, and other passenger facilities such as that. So it, it's a... Um, likely a 2021 okay. project okay, once we identify what the future bus network will be i know i've done a lot of budgeting and when you get this kind of a windfall you just get giddy and you just want to take care of everything at once <laughs> you commissioner Kemp. yes well and it's in terms of that too um if the csx tracks come into play they do go through the northwest all along bush mm -hmm. and so that might be a, a consideration in terms of that um, I was also concerned about the maintenance and operations center, knowing that that is one of our um, uh, biggest issues. We can't expand our bus service until we um, have a operations maintenance facility that can uh, accommodate uh, more buses than we have now. So I know that that's a, a huge need in how we deploy that. And part of it, I think, if I'm not mis mistaken, is um, thinking about kind of uh, other places where we can uh, open operations up and, st and start additional um, uh, centers uh, because as we know we are the size of the state of Rhode Island and for us um, especially as we grow to um, think about just um, one very limited even once expanded um, operations and maintenance center so uh, I'm uh, very concerned about how we do move that forward and I guess that does have to be in the it's not going to be in the operations part and it's not going to be in the fixed guideway part so it's got to be in the third bucket all those investments correct um, the other um, uh, thing that I'm, I'm looking at here in terms of operations I still am very um, <laughs> fixated and wanting us to be looking at Cyprus, which was a cut route, and I will say that I consider that a main route to go from downtown out to West Shore um, to the airport. That was a route that we used to have. It's gotten much more um, uh, TOD on it now by itself without us even serving it. It's a it's um, very key, and I know that not only I have talked about it for a few years, but I've heard. Uh, Mayor Castor bring it up several times, independent of me ever even saying, and I was surprised and pleased to see that it was also um, a priority for her. So I think it's really uh, important uh, that we look immediately at bringing back um, that route. It is a key, critical, important connection that um, I, I don't know why we ever cut it. So I just wanna bring that. Second, I'll go back again. And I know I was um, supposed to have a meeting um, with regards to uh, Fowler Avenue and um, the fact that you know we still are not looking at service across there, which I find very disturbing because I think it is, again, a key place and a place where until we do that connection across Fowler Avenue, um, we're not doing um, even the scratch in the surface of what we need to do to do a comprehensive and, um, and, and good service. And, um, I know it was the meeting was canceled with um, to good good effect. Someone having a, a, a baby, so <laughs> so I understand that. But I'm very concerned 
that right away, moving forward, we're not looking at um, this Fowler Avenue in a very serious way. So I really want to highlight Cypress and Fowler as um, getting those back in service um, to, or to service. Um, and and if, if need be, I have my own ideas about how this could happen. But <laughs> I just think it's really, really critical and key to as we move forward. My other comment is, it looks like in here. So what do you have? You have 10 electric buses and infrastructure, and then 30 CNG. How does that work? What is that? As of now, we've dedicated <coughs> an allocation of an additional 40 foot or 40 buses to be identified later. It, it actually could be more than 40 buses or less than fewer than 40 buses. It all depends upon our updated bus plan and the types of buses and, and number of buses that are gonna be able to support that um, service throughout 2020. I do also wanna, wanna clarify that the bus service um, enhancements that Mr. Cochran has, has outlined um, are a little bit less than 20% of the bus service expansion budget. Mm -hmm. Hart is going to be, for all intents and purposes, doubling the size of its bus system. Uh, that is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes time to buy buses. It takes time to recruit operators and, and um, other staff as well to support that system. Uh, we will be uh, expanding the bus service as quickly as possible. Uh, it could take a couple of years to get it fully ramped up. Uh, the other thing that we've heard from the community about is um, restoring a lot of services within the urban core, including 30th Street, Fowler, Cypress, and there are several others. Uh, we want to do that very strategically and really hear from, from the um, customers as well as the neighborhoods about which ones are most important to them. So, hope that clarifies a little bit on the on the number of buses. The um, I I would just like to uh, respond to that a little. I've been to a few community meetings and I did not bring it up. The audience members brought up that they were concerned because they had heard two presentations where our focus was on um, C and G. Um, I, for, I, I will say that I've been um, out there and um, talking about uh, the TECO plans to uh, put another gas plant when uh, other places are sh shutting down gas plants that are, um, have only reached a third of their useful lives um, and going to renewable and, and there's, you know, this is a, I feel like it's going to be, first of all, going to um, have a lot of um, fuel costs in the future that could occur if um, there are administrative changes, uh, changes federally uh, after the 20s that do a carbon tax, that put in a Clean Water Drinking Act <laughs> restrictions, that do, there's all kinds of things that could up the cost of fuel on the gas, um, on the natural gas. The second thing is once, if we put infrastructure in there, that's another thing that we're doing, expanding infrastructure for natural gas. Thirdly, I just found out that Miami has just ordered 75 electric buses. And uh, there's um, all over the country, there's, there's starting to be many of the larger services which are, um, have a goal of going all electric by 2030. So if we were to do big CNG purchases now with a 12 year life, um, those buses will be uh, well past 2030. So, and there's going to be, um, I can see a lot of public um, feedback on this. So I would just be um, very cognizant, I like to bring it up now, <laughs> of the fact that, that, that people will be looking at that. I know I have a, a meeting to talk to Congresswoman Castor, who's head of the climate change. You know, I think she'll be interested in, in where we're going um, with that too. So I like to bring it up as a greater consideration that going forward, um, and this probably isn't quite the place to do it, but that at least half of our new bus um, purchases should be uh, as of an electric nature as we 
move forward. And I understand the limitations, but um, I've talked to people at Proterra. They can definitely uh, get us buses as quickly as the CNG buses. So, uh, you know, I don't see that as a limitation in terms of price. They're now doing battery leasing. If we had to do that, uh, we could also be under the cost of the uh, CNG buses on that. So I just want to put that out there because I think it's really important for us to be forward looking, for us uh, to put um, buses out that um, will improve the community and uh, and move forward in a way that we want to move forward for the future. Okay, thank you. Adam? Did you have it? Mr. Chair? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick friendly suggestion for staff. I know uh, we were handed the uh, three page document that kind of breaks down uh, this, the one slide a little bit further. Um, and it's helpful, but it, it definitely, if before it goes to the board, I would definitely kind of uh, organize it a little bit differently. It just, it's a little. Um, you know, I know that the uh, items are broken down under the bolded line item, but it just it's just kind of hard to read. Okay. So I'm a big proponent of ma make it easy for them and uh, make it, you know, and there's also an app. Uh, so ju just kind of work on the table if this is advanced to the board as well as the IOC um, so that uh, it's very clear what the, the main categories and the subcategories are. Um, and, and to that point, there are several planning line items. I think, you know, to David Mechanic's point, um, if, if we can better kind of uh, kind of group those or show, you know, we have corridor studies, we have PDE studies, just kind of organize that a little bit better just so it's, so it's more distinguishable as to what we're doing and how much it's costing. Thank you. Yeah. Something else I just noticed on the handout. Um, what is the um, very alternative analysis? Are, and are we spending surtax money for that? Is that that was my question. I'm sorry, where's that? Yeah, the ferry analysis, oh, the, ferry. the background behind that. <coughs> what staff will likely do is incorporate that into the corridor studies for a conversation to be had with the, with the board as a whole as far as uh, what specifically to do with the ferry service. Uh, one of the thoughts there is, um, you know, clearly we need to go back and do a lot of reconnaissance and data gathering to, um, you know, take a look at what service options have been on the table in the past and um, how uh, we all got to the place where we are with the, you know, South County to McDill service that's been proposed. So I'm going to you know, recommend that we roll that into the corridor studies um, going so, forward. I would also clarify that before any corridor studies advance, whether it's the CSX or the ferry or Cyprus, we will come back to the board and brief you all on the work plan, budget, and schedule associated with each of those work pieces. I mean, I guess I have an underlying question. Do, should we be spending heart money at all on the ferry service? I mean, is that a legal thing for us to be spending money on either the surtax or other heart money? Well, part of what the business model is, as you know, for the ferry is to have a transit system that connects it in South County to access, bring the customers to the ferry location where it disembarks. So there's that, and there's also a service at McDill Air Force Base, which is a tram service. So I assume what they're looking at is just those corridors and not the water component of it. Simply, how would you serve a ferry if it does move forward in order to get the customers to, to the place where they can embark on it? Yeah. So that would be the on-land component of the <coughs> service we're talking about? or not the ferry, it's, I mean, I thought that's what Ms. Smith per was. Personally, and, and if I may, I don't think the ferry issue has been brought up to the full board, right. uh, in my understanding. Um, as, as you'd all recall, it's been punted to us for, in some nature fashion for them to discuss. Um, and, and my recommendation would be to strike the ferry service out of there until we get a board clarification on the way forward without assuming anything, in all honesty. I don't want to assume it's just the land portion of it because that gives credence to the water portion of it, and I don't think that's our place. But that's my opinion that I would, I would recommend we strike that from this list until 
we come together as a full board. And I have a comment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> yeah, I think, and not to speak for you, Mr. Mechanic, but I, I think when, when you made your comment, my thought was, yeah, I would not want us to fund a private entity study. Uh, you know, if, if, we're, if we're going to do something in partnership where we're studying our routes and it's a, and, and there's some privately funded route that the board approves of and says, okay, we're, we're good to look at that, right. then I can see advancing money for a study. But I, I, would, I would definitely want to proceed cautiously so we're not funding someone else's uh, route study. Commissioner, okay. Yeah, I just uh, um, speak to this because I don't, uh, I, I do think people have to understand more about it, but I would just say in federal, um, uh, uh, federally they recognized uh, ferries as fixed guideways um, under federal definitions. Um, New York City has added 19 ferries with five routes to incredible success that has happened. The Staten Island Ferry in New York, which is free, um, operates seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and carries 70,000 people per a day, which is twice every, every half hour. 70,000 people per day, which is getting to be about twice of our heart, entire heart service. So these are definitely transit services. And I don't, I don't understand the implication because I'm not sure what the reference is, is to privately funded. I can um, clarify. I, sure, I, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, so I'm, I'm a no opponent to private, privately funded, uh, you know, public-private partnerships uh, just on a personal level. I've been on the ferry systems both in uh, Washington State and North Carolina, and they're incredible. But I, th I think my, my point was that if, you know, if we have a, a partnership with a private entity, I would want to make sure that the negotiations and the, and the funding, and if they're going to be making right revenue off of this, that, that all of that squares, I guess. That, that was my only point. Yeah, and let me, let me just be clear if I can. I'm not, I'm not saying whether I'm for or opposed to ferry. That's not in this conversation here. All I'm saying is the ferry issue has not been brought up to the full board to give us direction on the way forward. Therefore, I think it's presumptuous of us to place this in the budget going forward without that discussion at the board level. And once we get the board level direction, we can go either way. I agree with you. Ferries have been very successful in other places. But I think we, as a committee, are inherent to get the board's direction before we proceed. That's and, all I'm and I'm not disagreeing with any of that. I'm just um, outlining because of some of the comments I heard. And just to clarify on that issue, um, by the way, um, the one of the reasons that HMS came forward, they're an operator, a hired operator at every other place in the nation, but. Hillsborough County was not willing to do that, and we kept hearing about, oh, the streetcars costing transit cost so much. And they were willing to take the cost, the risk of, because the county was not, and no one else was willing, even though it's been on our MPO plan for decades, <laughs> was willing to take the, uh, the um, loss, um, the risk of loss, um, to do the services. So um, like other places, that, they, that was the plan, so that there would not be any, um, anyone saying, wow, we're subsidizing these operations. So that was yeah, and and, and, that, and I think the discussion on the ferry would right. be helped for the board meeting. In uh, I do too. One, we're one we're quick, talking budget. Yeah, one, right. one quick quick point. Just historically, I just want the public to know and this board to know, having been here seven years, going back two CEOs ago, Hart approved a, a route change that was supportive of the ferry. So, at at, at this uh, you know in this room, Hart has been very supportive of the ferry mm -hmm. historically. I just right. want to point that okay. out. So, thanks. Any so. Good. So I just had a, so I, it's great that we're moving this forward. This is exciting that we're going to have a, our first uh, presentation to the, uh, to the IOC. So um, I, I would just comment that I think that the comment that the sheet's confusing is accurate. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to see it. Uh, I, I, I think it would be nice if it was clear to me that it was capital projects, um, operational expansions or projects and, and uh, administrative or planning projects and if it were broken down that way I think it would be a little bit more clear when it gets to the full board. Additionally, um, you know, I think that one of the biggest things that we need to undertake as we look to expand is um, the improvements of the maintenance facility and I see line items in here that under three or four different categories that I think equate to that. Some of them are, are uh, you know, I think uh, interim uh, improvements uh, 
to the operation control center, air handlers, stuff like that. But it would be nice, I think, um, again, if you know, there's a capital improvement category that clearly showed what we were doing there. And um, furthermore, I know there's been some, you know, discussions about, uh, you know, I know I've seen plans for the new uh, building um, that would be constructed, the new facility. I know today we heard a presentation about the potential for electric bus infrastructure at the FDOT property and um, that there's you know possibly a possibility of some property adjacent to the existing maintenance facility that um, Hart probably could or should control school board property um, prior to finalizing plans for the expansion of the operation and maintenance center so you know be I mean, it seems like that's significant. Like, if we're ordering a bunch of new buses and building electric infrastructure, um, you know, uh, that we have, you know, plants, right? how we're going to have enough space to do it, and that that's clearly outlined in this budget, because it seems like one of the most important things that we're getting the IOC to sign off on. And then just, you know, as a, as a former, you know, business executive, I mean, in my mind, you know, the planning stuff, I don't, I'm not sure I even need this much detail. I think the IOC should approve us, to, you know, mm -hmm. to spend X amount on, you know, fixed guideway planning and X amount on, you know, other route planning, whatever we need, and, and that's our budget for it. And they approve it, and then the board later can take these individual contracts up as appropriate. So, you know, more detail on the capital projects, more detail on the operational projects. A spreadsheet that when I look at it, like clearly I know what it means and less detail on the planning admin stuff. Just here's the budget for it, and then we as a board will decide later um, whether we want to study the ferry and what that means, you know. Um, anyway, my input, thank you. Okay, see you. Yeah, um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, staff has been coordinating with the county and the city, and we did identify a preferred format for the project list so it, uh, it will um, obviously take these comments back but I think I'll be quite pleased with the you know new format it's just going to be focused on project name you know two to four sentence summary of what the project is and then which funding bucket each of them will be part of so um, we will undoubtedly go back and make sure that this list is clear um, clear and concise and clearly communicates what our intent is with the sales tax monies. Okay. Okay. We need a motion. Um, one minute. Um, one suggestion on your slides, Chris, yes, sir. is <clears throat> we talked 2020 program of projects here, mm -hmm. um, but you are clearly mixing 19 and 20 dollars. Um, we don't specify that up front. We show that last slide where it shows both the 19 and 20 budgets we're going to receive or tentatively. I would recommend we put that somewhere up front. You can go right from, I believe, um, slide four and maybe introduce slide five as that. It, it's just a recommendation. Throwing it right up front to let them know that we are talking about two years of funding, not just one, okay. so that it, it reads better for the board. Thank you. Uh, I make a motion to advance the uh, IOC program projects uh, to the full board for discussion at the next regularly scheduled meeting. Second. Okay. You, Mr. McLean, you had suggested that we sort of single out the ferry as not something being part of the recommendation, but singled out for board discussion. Yeah, we can do that unless that's already on the agenda. Certainly. So I and staff will be providing an update on the ferry um, as well as a recommended path forward. So certainly we'll ensure that that's on the September board agenda. Okay. All right. Does that satisfy Mr. McCann? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay. We have a motion and a second to move the IOC priorities list to the full board. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's approved. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, committee actions. Uh, action number one, um, authorizing Chief Executive Officer to dispose of seven uh, paratransit vans and two non-revenue vehicles. Motion approved. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion's approved. Um, and with that, we are in adjournment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't quite.